I remember when I was a youth in a church and one of our members was reading a passage from this scripture. He announced it by saying that the reading today is from the book of Job. (laughs) And at the time I thought it was funny, you know, the slip of a tongue, um, a mispronunciation of the book of Job. But as I thought about it more, I kind of understood why he said job, and it was probably unintentional, but this, this scripture is hard work. See, Tennyson wrote that the book of Job, or the book of Job, is the greatest thing that was ever penned by man. And it's in part because this scripture asks some of the hardest questions. It's a book where a man faces the harshest realities of life, as he becomes sick, as his loved ones leave him, as he's left with superficial friends, as his property and his life, as everything, as he knows it, seems to unravel. He wonders, where is God in the midst of it all? And I have to confess, that's a question that has come across my lips, and maybe it's come across yours as well. And within this passage from this complicated book, May we take a moment and may we hear the peace of wild things. The text that the church office sent to me said this is from the book of Job, (laughs) J-O-F, but but I guessed it was Job. (laughs) However, call on the animals to teach you. The birds that sail through the air are not afraid to tell you the truth. Engage the earth in conversation. It's happy to share what it knows. Even the fish of the sea are wise enough to explain it to you. In fact, which part of creation isn't aware? Which doesn't know the eternal's hand has done this? His hand cradles the life of every creature on the face of the earth. His breath fills the nostrils of humans everywhere. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations, the questions, the searching, the longing of all of our hearts be glorified in your sight. For you, O God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When the Bible was written, human engagement with the natural world was intimate. The sun rose, and so did you. There were no blackout curtains at the time. And when the sun set, so too did you, as you prepared to settle in for the darkness of night. Jesus' parables are filled with seeds and farmers, with fig trees and tenants. They spoke of the immediate things that surrounded humanity. I sometimes wonder if Jesus was to come back today, if the parables would be filled with technological metaphors, like blessed are those who do not troll, snap, tweet, or post in ways that hurt others, or for theirs is the kingdom of God. Or maybe blessed are those who are on free or reduced lunch, that there is nothing free or reduced about them in the eyes of God. But I also wonder if Jesus would have kept his message. Even in the midst of our technologically saturated world about the earth. I wonder if Jesus spoke of the earth and not books and scrolls. If he went to the desert and not some palace or air-conditioned oasis with room service. I wonder if Jesus spoke of the land of dirt and of sweat. I wonder if a dove descended on the day that Jesus was baptized and his disciples hiked up mountains because Jesus knew something that we know too, or at least we knew, that creation has lessons to teach us. With its buds and shoots, so too the gospel lies there. Somewhere along the way, we leveled up. We specialized to a point where we don't have to roll up our sleeves or our nails are free from dirt, and we don't have to worry about the grubs and the spiders. Where our focus seems to be right here rather than all around here. 
the earth has something to teach us. And as much as I love technology and the advances that it offers me, I appreciate modern medicine for helping me avoid polio and smallpox, but, but what if instead of solely benefiting from these new acquired technologies and skills, what if we are also missing out? What if we're missing out on a message that God truly intends for us? Lessons about how to live and to love and to lose. Lessons about worry and anxiety. Lessons about caring for ourselves as we care for the earth. Lessons about death and resurrection. What if we have missed out on the peace of wild things? And so let us have ears to hear and eyes to see. Let us open our hearts and our minds and our imaginations. And let the world teach us of God's glory. Since I have started at our church almost four years ago now, I have preached on every Earth Sunday. And I don't know if that's because I have a background in environmental science or Pastor Seth just doesn't want to touch Earth Sunday with a 10-foot pole. He loves his uh, styrofoam cups from Dunkin' Donuts and driving in his car. <laughs> but <laughs> I've preached on how, our need, uh, how we have a need for creation care and how caring for creation is a necessary part of our faith. I've preached on the inherent worth of the earth and how God made the world first, declaring it good days before we even came into the picture. But today, I can't help but wonder at the lessons that the earth has to teach us, the truth and wisdom that lies all around us. And I wonder if the earth also preaches the gospel. As we just heard from Job, call on the animals to teach you, the birds that sail through the air are not afraid to tell you the truth. Engage the earth in conversation. It's happy to share what it knows. Wendell Berry, one of my favorite authors and poets, puts it like this in his poem, The Peace of Wild Things. He writes, When despair for the world grows in me, I wake at night at the least of sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. And for a time, I rest in the grace of the world and I am free. The world has something to teach us. The world has something to teach us about worry and anxiety. How many of us wake, or maybe we can't even fall asleep in the first place, because of our worry, our fear. We fear, we fear that this is not enough, or that we should get that, or do that, or be that. We fear tragedy that has not yet come and may never come. We fear the tragedy that has not yet come and is inevitable for us all. And some of it we can control, but so little of it we can control. And our minds race and our hearts beat and we circle down. But like Barry, the wild things have something, something to teach us. Not the wild things that roar their terrible roar and gnash their terrible teeth, as the children's book by Maurice Sendek writes, but the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. Barry and the author of Job and Jesus and Matthew all teach us that we cannot paralyze ourselves by living in fear of anticipatory grief, mourning those things that are not and might not ever be. Jesus says in Matthew, look to the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. Don't they all have what they need? For who has added one minute to their life by worrying? 
the world teaches us to be present, to breathe deep what is before us, to plan and prepare, yes, but also to let go, to recognize our own powerlessness, our own lack of control. The earth also teaches us how to care for ourselves. I met with some gardeners from our church and some landscape architects, and it was beautiful to talk to them about the ways that the earth has taught them how to tend for themselves, and in tending the soil, they also tended their souls. Gardening is often described as a therapeutic activity. And I wonder if we take the intentionality around gardening and we apply it to our own lives, if it too would allow things to flourish and thrive. See, in the Bible, we read time and time again of how precious humanity is to God, how precious each and every one of us is to God, how we were knit together in our mother's womb, how we were loved and beloved before we were even born. But I wonder if you live, and I wonder if I live, as if we really believe that message. See, being a novice gardener myself, I've learned a couple things that are not only true about gardening, but also about God, and maybe God's hope for my life. The first lesson I learned <laughs> is that you have to plant a garden somewhere where it can thrive. Our house is surrounded by many trees, and I remember when we first moved in, setting potted plants out under the shade of those trees. No sooner had I set them there than they had began to wither and to die. How often do we try to mash our square peg into some round hole, making ourselves fit somewhere that will not let us grow and thrive? A garden will die without the environment it needs. And really, we do too. Another lesson that I learned is that you have to check in regularly. A friend of mine, whose father is a farmer in southern Illinois, talked about this checklist that he has. See, my friend's father does not plant a crop and then hope to God that all works out well. No, he continually checks in. He checks what the nutrient level of the soil is, if the watering system is working, if there are needs or, or weeds or pests that are getting in the way. And I wonder what are the ways that we can check in regularly or create a checklist for our souls so that we can tend our gardens, picking those weeds that would otherwise strangle the fruit of our spirits. Maybe the weeds of unhealthy relationship or maybe the weeds of taking in toxic substances or self-talk. We need to pluck these things out so that we can grow and thrive. We have to make sure that we give ourselves the external nutrients we need as well. Asking the questions of who are our support network. Or maybe you just need some quiet time alone every day. A walk or maybe you need a friend who is there to listen and to talk. Another lesson that I had to learn the hard way is that sometimes, regardless of how much you plan and prepare and know how much time and energy and effort you put into the garden, you got to let it go. Sometimes it doesn't work out the way you thought, but that life's composts and you can till it under. That there are things that we can control in this life, and there are things that we can try to avoid, and we do our best to cultivate. But with our gardens and with our own lives, sometimes there's a blight or a pest comes, and sometimes you just have to till it under and begin again, recognizing that your plans might not come out as you thought, but that what was goes back to the earth. Those experiences, relationships, jobs, they become nutrients for what's next. And there is pain there, but it also helps to create newness of life. Our earth teaches us lessons about how to care for ourselves, to plant somewhere where we can thrive, to check in regularly, and to let go. 
The earth has many lessons, more than these two around worry and anxiety and self-care. But this week, a final lesson struck close to my heart, and it was a lesson of death and resurrection. On Wednesday, I got a call from my mom that the hospice nurse was giving my grandmother 24 to 48 hours to live. And as I made my way to her bedside, a few hours after she died, I held her cold hand, and I looked into her pale face, and I was struck. What happens when death comes amidst the newness of life? As petals pushed forth outside the window from frozen ground in all their spring glory, she returns to the ground from where we all came. When death, when death, when God took the earth and breathed life, creating humanity from the dirt, she returns and we all will return. Our lives are limited. And within our lives, there are cycles. We live in a world that wants constant harvest. We want abundance. We want youth. We want to be immortal, but we're not. And the moments in our lives will also end. But on this third Sunday of Easter and on this baptism Sunday, we are also reminded of the newness of life and of the potential and possibility that those new lives hold. And on this third Sunday of Easter, we hold fast to belief that even as things end and even as we too will end, that it is not the end and that God's love remains. It remains as we let go of our anxiety and worry, or maybe even in the midst of it. God's love remains as it calls us to tend and care for ourselves as we would a garden, or maybe as we would a young child. God's love remains as we let go of our illusion of immortality. God's love remains. And so let us open our ears to hear and our eyes to see. Let us open our minds and our hearts to imagination. And let the world teach us of the love of God that remains now and forevermore. Amen.